Hello everyone, I'm Rick Jenkins and I'm the publisher at SC Biz News. We're the media company that serves about 100,000 business executives throughout South Carolina. Welcome to SC Biz TV. Welcome to another episode in our ongoing video series, Industry Trends. Today we're going to be talking about a promising technology that has been uh, uh, in today's lexicon for quite some time, and it is called blockchain. You've heard of blockchain, but not only do you have blockchain, but you have a lot of other impressive sounding terminology, things like cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. And you all have heard of that. I mean, our readers and our viewers are smart folks, and so you've heard of blockchain, of course, but if you're like me, you might not know it and understand it quite as well as you'd like to. And today, we're going to try and fix that. And uh, we're joined by an expert in the field, and his name is Derek Apple. Derek is a partner at Gerard, Now and Russell, and they are a CPA firm and a business advisory firm that is headquartered over in Charleston. And they also do business throughout South Carolina. Derek, welcome to the show, man. Thank you so much for having me. We are going to talk about blockchain. Now, as I said, um, I only know enough to be a little bit dangerous here. And so I'm glad you're here to, to kind of point me in the right direction. I understand the basics, but you correct me if I'm wrong. Blockchain is basically a, a technology that allows us to, uh, to record data and transfer data in a much more secure fashion than we've never been able to do that before. Almost hack-proof, not always, but uh, fairly hack-proof. Uh, and that's that's what we're dealing with today. Tell me about blockchain from your perspective, sir. Well, I think the blockchain story, it, it has a, a recent history. Going back to the mid-2000s, a professor or uh, someone operating under the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto uh, wrote a white paper that described a digital currency and this took place back in the mid 2000s. And as a result of the white paper, um, Bitcoin technology was born and blockchain was the technology that underlined Bitcoin. So you had both technologies coming from um, the mid 2000s. And shortly thereafter, you know, the coin was launched. And we've seen it replicated over and over again with numerous coins out there today. Uh, but the way you can understand blockchain technology is think of a database, or in this case, a long string of data. And each piece of data is linked cryptographically to the prior piece of data to where one piece of data builds on the other. And as the chain grows longer, security increases. And Bitcoin is not the only form of cryptocurrency available, right? There are other forms of cryptocurrency, even though Bitcoin, of course, is the one that we're most familiar with. Is that correct? That's right. So you have Bitcoin. That is the, you know, that's the one everybody knows about. But Ethereum is a also a large player is the number two cryptocurrency. And I'm not talking about market cap. I'm talking about the number of developers actively working on the cryptocurrency. So Ethereum uh, was started by a 17 year old uh, Vitalik Buterin. And that technology, it, it enables things that Bitcoin did not implement, implement, such as smart contracts. That's a big thing. NFTs, uh, non-fungible tokens. Um, it enables uh, certain things to happen on the blockchain that just going beyond it being a, just a simple currency. You know, Derek, I remember when I was 17 years old and I certainly could not have invented a, a currency sitting uh, at, at, at my Commodore 64 computer in my room. Nonetheless, my how things have changed. There are all kinds of ways that we can use blockchain now. And I want you to give us a couple of examples because it is becoming popular in things like transferring medical uh, information and things like that. Give us a couple of examples of uh, everyday use. There's a lot of hope that the banking industry will fully um, fully adopt blockchain technology. Um, there's a lot of investment happening in that place as uh, currently. Um, we see the potential for loans to take place 
on uh, the blockchain, such as for mortgage lending, car loans. Um, there's the potential for uh, deed documents for car titles. Um, as it stands now, they are lending money on crypto right now um, through smart contracts. You can get loans. Um, one big uh, area we see um, for a, a, a huge use of crypto is cross-border payments. And um, you have, you know, there's, you know, tried and true Western Union out there now. Um, you know, the, us folks utilize that, you know, um, you know, on an everyday basis, sending money, you know, cross border and cryptocurrency is going to able, enable folks to do that for way less cost than, than currently. Um, we saw cryptocurrency playing a large role in the Ukrainian uh, invasion. Um, we have seen uh, numerous uh, folks all over the world uh, sending crypto uh, to Ukrainians um, and they're able to get around any kind of um, banking or internet outages. Um, and, and in addition, you know, you also had the Russians who were dealing with the devalued ruble and they were able to, um, to shift their funds into cryptocurrency to avoid uh, the huge devaluation of their country's, country's uh, currency. Uh, you also had the oligarchs uh, taking advantage of that as well. Um, but I think that just comes with the territory. You know, there, um, there have been a lot of concerns that cryptocurrency is, is not currently regulated by any kind of a, uh, official federal authority, even though the SEC, the Security Exchange Commission, uh, is taking more steps to ensure that it is regulated to some degree. Talk to us a little bit about that. Uh, what regulation is out there and, and how might that look different as we head down the road? Well, the SEC has assumed regulatory authority over cryptocurrency. Um, you s we've seen members of Congress um, really going in, uh, really diverging on that, um, on, have, on the SEC being the regulator, um, because I think it, it boils down to the fundamental notion that crypto is more of a currency instead of a security. Right. And I think once that argument is resolved, I think we're going to see a lot more clarity with regulation. But as it stands now, the SEC is stepping up its, uh, its enforcement actions. They've recently doubled its crypto enforcement staff to, uh, perceive, uh, to pursue perceived securities violations. You know, you said a, uh, what, before we sat down to do this uh, video over the last uh, week or two, we've exchanged several emails. And one of the emails, you, you wrote a sentence in an email that um, I'm going to read right here because I have no idea what you said. All right. So I'm going to ask you to explain it to me. Here was your line. Crypto mining for proof of work coins remains the most trusted way to secure a crypto network. What the heck did I just read there? So within a crypto network, um, you have controlled inflation. And when I, when I say controlled inflation, I mean there are new coins released on the blockchain. So with Bitcoin, um, the new coins are released at a ever decreasing rate uh, with the final coins being released sometime next century. Well, the, to find these coins, for these coins to be minted on the network, it relies on computing power, which is known as mining. And crypto mining involves essentially solving a mathematical problem and finding a new block on the blockchain. And that process, through the process of finding these coins, so it, it, it produces an incentive for these miners to get on there and verify transactions. So the transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain are being verified by these miners. And the reason they're doing it is because they're being rewarded with block rewards, 
which is the controlled inflation on the blockchain. Speaking of rewards, Bitcoin is currency. Um, it's a different kind of currency, of course, than we're used to having. It's not in our wallet, but nonetheless, it is currency. And I would assume that since it is currency, that exchanges are, are taxable, yes? Yeah, that's correct. And I, I think, you know, there, there's a huge distinction between just buying crypto and buying it and then selling it. So you got to understand if you buy Bitcoin, if you were to purchase it today, you know, around $25,000, $30,000 a coin, and you were to hold it for, let's say, six months and it doubles in value, as long as you're holding it, you're not going to owe any tax on that. But if you turn around and you also then sell the coin, like you would sell a stock, you would recognize a gain. And short-term gains, long-term gains, those come into play just like they do with stock sales. And that if you hold something for over a year, you get favorable tax treatment on those long-term gains. How does the IRS even track cryptocurrency activity? Or do they just rely on you to tell the truth? Yeah, so they have, uh, I think in the early days of crypto, um, they were, they didn't really have a strategy um, to go after or to understand the transactions even. Um, so it, I think it, it used to be where they would issue subpoenas to like, for instance, Coinbase um, in order to get information on crypto sales and transactions. Um, they have developed tools um, to track um, the, the ledgers of various cryptocurrencies. Um, so Bitcoin and Ethereum, the two largest players, they have public ledgers. And what that means is every transaction that has ever taken place on the blockchain is there and it's public record and it will be there forever. And so the IRS has developed tools to analyze this activity and to kind of follow trends. They can follow transactions and uh, they've gotten pretty good at it and you're just going to get better. How much, act, how much activity have you seen your clients bring to the table? I mean, how much has this increased, uh, Derek, in the last few years? What's happening from your seat? Well, the big thing we've seen, um, you know, there's been a lot more talk, I feel like, um, with uh, whether it's network news, um, people following the, you know, the ups and downs of the market. So people are a lot more aware of it and aware that it is taxable. So we've seen a large uptick in clients bringing in, um, uh, I guess, brokerage statements with crypto transactions on them. We've also seen clients bringing in um, their crypto wallet uh, exports, showing us the, the transactions um, for reporting. I would assume it's only going to continue to grow as we move forward. Is there anything that makes you think that this is a fad that will slowly dissipate? No, I don't think so. Um, I think, you know, I'm a child of the 80s and I, I grew up in the infancy of the Internet. And, you know, my first experience on the Internet was with dial up modem, um, getting on Prodigy and America Online and just seeing those days of the internet and then it developing into us carrying around an internet able enabled device on our hips at all times. Um, that was a huge disrupt disruptive technology. Um, and cryptocurrency, um, it has the exact same hallmarks that the internet had. Um, I don't see it going anywhere. There's too much promise in it. There's too much investment in it. Um, as it stands now, um, there is uh, there's way too much potential in it. And um, I think it's got a very exciting future. I think you are probably right that folks, that is Derek Apple. Derek is the partner at Gerard now and Russell. They are a CPA and business advisory firm headquartered over there in Charleston in the low country doing business throughout South Carolina. Derek, I appreciate you so much uh, being with us and shedding a little light on this great piece of technology we call blockchain. Thanks a lot, Rick. You're welcome. Folks, that is another episode of Industry Trends here on SC Biz TV. Thank you for joining us. Stick around. Don't go anywhere. See if there's anything else on our statewide YouTube channel that you might like to check out, and we will see you next time.